Hello, it's Bruce Williams again, and it's time for part 14 of my section on the selected gross pathology of the GI tract. And today we're primarily going to be talking about bacterial diseases of the large intestine in a variety of species. As I do at the beginning of all of my lectures, I want to thank those friends and colleagues who have provided me their images over the years on online collections or directly, which allow me to put these lectures together. In the last lecture, we were talking about viral diseases of the large intestine, and I neglected to mention an important one, one that is seen in cytosine birds, primarily macaws, and African gray parrots. This is citizen, citizen herpes virus 2, and it can be identified from the normal cloacal mucosa of African gray parrots, but causes papillomas of the oral cavity several sites in the GI tract, including the crop, which we looked at earlier in another lecture, the ventric ventriculus, proventriculus, and of course the cloaca in macaws and parrots. It has also, also been associated with intercurrent disease, especially carcinomas of the bile duct and pancreas in some birds. It bears about 80% genomic similarity to cytosine herpes virus type 1. The disease we'll look at when we look at the liver and the causes a necrotizing process known as Pacheco's disease. The possibility that papillomaviruses cause these lesions was discounted a number of years ago, but there are other causes of papillomas, including chronic irritation with hyperplasia and malnutrition with vitamin A. Papillomaviral inf viral infections have been demonstrated in a number of species though, including African greys, finches, and Cuban Amazons. Since I'm a big lumper of diseases, let's talk about other diseases affecting the cloaca. This is a case of cloacal prolapse in an image by my friend Rob Porter. And remember the cloaca or vent of the laying hen averts whenever an, a, an egg is laid. And if the egg is extremely large relative to the cloaca lumen or the everted cloaca is traumatized by other hens by pecking at it, it may remain in an inverted position known as cloacal prolapse. There are a lot of factors that are related to cloacal prolapse in hens, including the size of the bird. As younger, smaller birds will have a much more everted mucosa, which becomes attractive to the other animals uh, around them to peck out because it's pink, it is something different. But then you also have to include the strain of bird, the quality of the ration they're eating, the amount of floor or feeder or drinker space, the quality of the beak trim, the light intensity. So all of these generally factor into the level of cloacal damage that is seen in a flock. Here is a cloaca that has been damaged by other birds. Some people call this cannibalism or peck out. Obviously, the swollen, traumatized tissue cannot go back inside the animal's body. It remains a target. The animals will die either from hemorrhage or from shock. Okay, let's move on to the bacterial diseases, as promised, of the large intestine. This is a classic disease of foals, primarily four to six months of age. When they get to this point, we are looking at the colon and the mesenteric lymph nodes. Actually, we're probably looking at the cecum at this point in the mesenteric lymph nodes. And you can see through the wall of the gut, there are large areas of either necrosis or granulomatous, granulomatous inflammation or both. And the mesenteric lymph nodes along the outside of the cecum are greatly expanded by granulomatous inflammation. Here is another case with large coalescing lymph nodes. And in a young foal, when you see this presentation, you want to think about rhodococcus equi. 
Rhococcus is an acid-fast organism, much like mycobacteria, which is almost ubiquitous in the soil. It is an inhaled pathogen and in animals that have impaired immunocompetence will set up granulomatous inflammation in the lungs primarily and then eventually will be coughed up, swallowed, go to the large intestine like most mycobacteria and enter the system through the M cells resulting in uptake by macrophages, residents within the wall of the gut and trafficking to local lymph nodes but the macrophages cannot eliminate this bacterial agent and the animal develops a systemic granulomatous response. In this particular case with this image if I was looking at an adult animal I would probably think about Streptococcus equi infection, so-called bastard strangles. Strep equi usually remains up around the nasal cavity and the mandibular lymph nodes and retropharyngeal lymph nodes in infected animals, but about 20% may escape that confine and go systemically, resulting in large abscesses. Um, throughout the body, especially within the mesenteric lymph nodes. So this picture is a little dependent upon the age of the animal that you are talking about. If we open up the gut, over all of the areas of lymphoid tissue, you are going to see these very classic volcano ulcers due to rhodococcus. Volcano ulcers are narrow at the top, they are wide and underrun, at the base, normally because you have necrosis of the underlying lymphoid tissue, you have a proliferative response of the overlying mucosa. There's really nothing that holds lymphoid tissue together. So there's no stroma, so the necrosis tends to, to run way to the sides at the bottom while the, the mucosa is trying to heal itself. This is very classic for rhodococcus, not the only time we see volcano ulcers, but for rhodococcus in the folds is a very classic presentation. All folds of rhodococcus will have pulmonary lesions, with the exception of about 5% where they're enteric only. But half of those folds with the pulmonary lesions will have the enteric lesions. So almost 100% lung lesions, 50% uh, lung and gut lesions, and a 5% gut only. It's only rarely seen in the small intestine. This is an older horse, and these are small abscesses throughout the uh, throughout the lungs. And this is this is strep equi again. Proper name is strep equi subspecies equi. This is an animal that had probably a retropharyngeal abscess, and then either through lymphatic spread or coughed it up and swallowed it, and there are miliary abscesses throughout the large intestine, often involving the lymphoid tissue. Okay, here's a great disease of pigs, um, and a number of additional species within the last 15 or 20 years have been incriminated in causing this particular lesion. We are looking at the spiral colon, which has been opened up. It is diffusely reddened, and there is a fibrinonecrotic membrane. This has a, a number of different presentations, but usually always associated with uh, at least superficial fibrinonecrotic colitis. The name of the disease is swine dysentery. The cause is brachyspira hyodysenteriae, although a number of other agents including Brachyspira hampsoni, and in some cases, Brachyspira pilosicoli um, will give a very similar picture. You don't want to confuse this for Lawsonia. Lawsonia generally affects the ileum, and Brachyspira infection, or swine dysentery, always affects the large intestine. You may find other secondary bacterial or uh, uh, protozoan invaders, 
Valentidium coli is a common inhabitant of the gut of the pig, normally lives very happily in the intestine, but in co-infections may migrate into the wall. And it's very important not to ascribe all the pathology of these particular cases to balantidiasis. Here is another picture of Brachyspira hyodysenteriae. Okay, this one looks a lot more necrotic. People have, have described these lesions as shaggy or Turkish towel lesions. I just put this near the top when I'm thinking of necrotizing diseases that affect the colon. Salmonella, especially Salmonella typhimurium, has to be considered in the differential diagnosis for these cases as well. This one looks much more reddened. This one is uh, Brachyspira hampsoni. But the two in a recent publication by Dr. Bailey Wilberts at Veterinary Path, it was shown that you really can't tell the difference grossly. There is a second, somewhat milder form of Brachyspira in pigs and in some other species, which are caused by Brachyspira pyro, uh, pylosicoli. Um, the histologic presentation is something different. There are many more agents in pylosicoli. There are so many that in affected pigs or affected non-human primates or guinea pigs, all of which get this disease, which is called an intestinal spirochetosis. The spirochetes will actually fill up just about every square millimeter of tissue, and they will sit on end. And when you look at it ultrastructurally, it's like a grand forest of bacteria. The lesions are considered less severe. Generally, it doesn't cause a tremendous amount of diarrhea and death in the affected species. And you wonder, looking at the ultrastructural presentation, how this animal isn't more sick. Obviously, there can be co-infections between different species of Brachyspira, and any suspect case should have culture or PCR done to identify the particular species present. In addition, there are a number of non-disease-causing uh, Brachyspira in pigs, including Brachyspira innocens, Intermedia, and Murdoch, um, which may need to be differentiated as well. This somewhat edematous proliferative colitis is from a non-human macaque with colonic spirochetosis. There are a number of other rule outs. Very difficult to look at the colon of a macaque and, and decide exactly what's going on. I would also have to consider Campylobacter. There are other brachyspires, including Brachyspira alborgi, which have been isolated from the colon of macaques. And then, even though it is not red and really ugly looking, I'm going to consider the four different types of Shigella as well. There's another species that gets uh, intestinal spirochetosis due to Brachyspira hyodysenteriae, and this is the these are ratites, including ostriches and emus in the rhea. Another ratite, um, Brachyspira can uh, cause a significant necrotizing tiflitis and colitis with high mortality. Brachyspira intermedia, which we mentioned in pigs, can cause tiflitis and diarrhea in chickens as well. Brachyspira pylosicoli has been identified as causing diarrhea and decreased egg production in chickens. And one more, Brachyspira alvin pulii, has been identified with tiflitis and reduced growth rate. So, so these Brachyspiras can do damage in a number of species. We need to think about the possibility of Shigella in non-human primates. Shigella is another hot gram-negative, um, often brought in by human carriers and causes a very classic necrotizing, angry-looking uh, colon. 
Now, Shigella is not all of that uh, specific about where in the gut it hits. It will also cause a gastritis. It will cause a gingivitis. It will cause an enteritis. But the lesions that are associated with the colon are well known for their angry red appearance in large areas of necrosis, the mesenteric lymph nodes, are markedly enlarged, which is not uncommon with severe bacterial disease in a number of species as the reticuloendothelial system kicks in the high gear. It can take just about any form. This is a little bit more multifocal, coalescing areas of necrosis. Remember, look for thrombosis. It's another gram-negative, so when the body is able to, to destroy the bacteria, it's going to, with its last gasp, going to throw out that lipopolysaccharide endotoxin, cause endothelial damage and thrombosis. So a lot of the lesions that we see are here are thrombotic in nature. An examination of submucosa will generally show significant edema and thrombosed vessels. Just one more picture of Shigella showing that really reddish appearance. The classic entity of non-human primates. Sticking with the hot gram negatives, yersiniosis is a gram negative that is carried by rodents, occasionally causes diseases in rodents and rabbits, as seen here, and loves to attack initially. Like all those gram negatives, the lymphoid tissue of the ilium, the mesenteric lymph nodes, and the spleen. It eventually will get into other tissues, but it always starts with the lymphoid tissue. In the rabbit, the sacculus rotundus, or the entrance to the cecum, and the appendix is replete with lymphoid tissue, which due to the necrosis becomes very prominent in this particular slide. Yersiniosis is also a common bacterium that is seen in uh, non-human primates, especially in animals and zoos in which rodent control is not practiced rigorously. These small roadside uh, zoos, if rodents get into the feed room and defecate or urinate on the feed, or they're running through the cages, the monkeys will jump down, will smack them and cram them in their mouth, and it's a great uh, situation for transfer of Yersinia enterocolitica, Yersinia pseudotuberculosis, resulting in necrosis with large colonies of bacteria, initially in the GI tract, but rapidly spreading to other organs, including the liver. Here's a cone of a horse that's been opened up. There's been tremendous uh, fluid accumulation with hemorrhage within it. This is a condition that's sort of been a catch-all over a number of years, and it's called colitis X. This is probably a multifactorial disease associated with severe stress, exhaustion, possibly administration of non-steroidals, and a number of other conditions. Um, no single factor, especially bacterial factors, have uh, been isolated in this particular condition. Uh, clostridium, especially clostridial difficile, paracute salmonellosis or endotoxin, have all been identified as potential causes of colitis X. This disease is associated with a 90 to 100 percent mortality. Uh, blood changes are fairly significant with the animals being tremendously hypovolemic with hemoconcentration over 65 uh, percent. The animals are often neutropenic. There is evidence of disseminated intravascular coagulation and extensive hemorrhage in the wall of the affected cecum and colon. It's generally quite a peracute disease. In some of the cases, Clostridium perfringens type A has been isolated, but needs to be isolated very soon at necropsy. So a lot of questions still about colitis X. Oh, while we're talking about Clostridium difficile, there is extensive edema in the mesocolon of this neonatal pig, which is one of the classic lesions associated with Clostridium difficile, a slightly older pig. I would be thinking about the possibility of shigatoxin-producing E. coli. 
because the mesocolon is an area that is rife with receptors for, for global acyl transferase, which is what the shiga toxins attach to. Other sites that you may see edema in those particular animals would be the wall of the mucosa, certain sites in the skin, especially the eyelids, the larynx, and certain parts of the brain. More clostridial disease. This is a guinea pig. We are looking at the guinea pig cecum, and there is hemorrhage. When we see hemorrhage, we want to think about necrosis. There's transmural hemorrhage and necrosis in the wall of the cecum, and that is because somebody probably a number of years ago, when we didn't know that much about guinea pigs, gave it a good blast of a number of different types of antibiotics, which are antagonistic to many of the positive gram-positive organisms within the lumen, which keep all of the bad actors in check. When we get into the rodents, as we go further down the phylogenetic tree, into the birds, into reptiles, there's a higher number of gram-positives within the normal bacteria flora. The bad actors are often clostridials or gram-negative agents. And so a good blast into a guinea pig or a rabbit of penicillin or the mycins, lincomycin, uh, erythromycin, would often cause a severe enough dysbiosis with a single dose to result in the death of the animal as a result of proliferation in the rabbit, Clostridium difficile, uh, now called Clostridioides difficile, i got to keep that one straight, and uh, uh, Clostridium spiriformi are the two that are most often seen causing uh, fatal necrotizing tiflitis and colitis in rabbits and, uh, and guinea pigs. Oh, here's our mesocolon again. So just remember, this could be a demon disease in a very young pig. This is probably Clostridium uh, or Clostridioides difficile in this great picture by Tom Cecier. Oh, here's a fantastic picture showing the tremendous edema, the lack of necrosis, but the tremendous edema that you will see in the colon of horses associated with equine monocytic ehrlichiosis, also known as Potomac horse fever, depending on the part of the country that you live in, or my favorite name, the Shasta River Crud. Now, this is not specific. Let's never forget the great masquerader, Salmonella, which will cause a similar edematous, non-hemorrhagic, non-necrotizing lesion in a certain proportion of horses. Maybe even colitis X could look like this. Potomac horse fever is caused by a bacteria of the rickettsial family called Neorickettsia restichii. used to be called Ehrlichia, but it's been reclassified, and it's usually associated with trematodes, in freshwater snails. It may also be transmitted by arthropod because the disease is seasonal in certain parts of the area. It's an ob obligate intracellular bacterium which affects macrophages and these infected cells have a predilection to show up in the cecum and the colon. When they're in the colon they can affect a number of other cells including the enterocytes resulting in necrosis and loss of the overlying mucosa. They do show up with silver stains, such as Dieterle stains or a good Steiner stain. Affected animals show a range of signs, including a profuse, non-fetid, watery diarrhea, and the disease may be complicated by endotoxemia. A classic sequela is foundering usually within three days, thought maybe to be secondary to that endotoxemia and abortion by pregnant mares. It is likely that most cases of neorickettsia infection are subclinical. Let's move on to ferrets. We're looking at the colon of a ferret and normally the colon is very thin. They say you can read a newspaper through it and that's probably about right. This one is extremely thick and the animal is very painful and it poops 
every 15 minutes or so with Frank Blood. This is what is seen with Lawsonia in the ferret. Ferrets are another outlier because they develop a colonic infection rather than an enteric infection. When we talk about Lawsonia and every other species, it's going to be generally found in the ilium. Ferrets get all the lesions associated with Lawsonia, but they just move it back an organ or two. And here we see an opened up colon from a ferret, and there are these large areas of glandular hyperplasia. The presence of the organism within the apical cytoplasm of these bacteria causes an uncontrolled glandular proliferation of immature non-mucous cell hyperplasia. It is often surrounded by profound lymphoplasmic inflammation as well as fine bleeding spots. So when these animals defecate, you see this sort of liquidy, bloody poop, and they're absolutely miserable. Thankfully, this is a disease that responds very well to chloramphenicol, not something that you want to use widely, but uh, many bird practitioners uh, often will have chloromycetin as part of their pharmacologic armamentarium, so it's not too difficult to get a hold of if you want to. Well, there's a non-specific finding when we have all these bacterial and diarrheal diseases, especially in pigs, you will often get rectal prolapse, and this is a real problem. It's just like vent prolapse in birds. Um, Diarrheal disease is probably the most common cause of rectal prolapse in pigs, um, but other causes of rectal prolapse would include cold stress because the animals will pile on top of the, each other for warmth, and the one on the bottom tends to struggle a lot, may prolapse its rectum. Same thing will happen during transport, and it can even be seen in pigs with severe respiratory disease and coughing. Okay, let's finish up with uh, one or two more, uh, one more sort of unknown, uh, with two, sorry, I'm skipping, there we go. Um, another classic uh, disease which starts in the large intestine, uh, commensal organism in rodents, but we can see it in a number of species, including uh, uh, foals, including cats, even immunosuppressed people is Tizer's disease. This is Clostridium piliforme. It's a normal commensal in the GI tract of rodents and rabbits. And under stress in, in cases of dysbiosis, may decide that the grass is greener elsewhere. And it will migrate into the wall of the colon and cecum, causing necrosis, getting into the portal system, whereupon it goes to the liver, resulting in these little white dots, which are areas of necrosis. The organism releases a, a toxin, which is very much like a perforin. It's happy to punch holes in whatever cells next to it, whether it's an inflammatory cell, whether it's a hepatocyte. And if this is not enough, the colonic and the liver lesion, the necrosis therein is not enough to kill the animal, well then eventually it's going to get into the rest of circulation and it will uh, invade myocardial cells, cause them to die and the animal will die of heart failure. But most rodents will die in the earlier stages um, where the necrosis is in the liver and the colon. A great diagnosis for multifocal necrosis in a rodent of any species, including beavers and muskrats. Um, in foals, interestingly, the uh, intestinal lesion has never been seen. It causes a massive necrosis of the liver. The foals generally get into the organism by eating the feces of the mare. The mare may be on a postpartum diet, which is high in carbohydrate, causes sort of an overgrowth of this agent, and then it passes out the feces. Mare has no trouble, but it's just the nature of uh, of young foals, they get a lot of vitamins, um, B vitamins from the mother's feces, so they do eat feces, and they can also get a whopping dose of Clostridium piliforme. Um, it is not a normal commensal in dogs and cats, but it is occasionally seen. Um, 
can cause lesions in the, the large and small intestine. If you look in, in cases of necrotizing ileitis and colitis, uh, there's a great case in the 2018-2019 Wednesday slide conference, conference three, showing the necrosis in the colon of a, of a kitten. And you can see these very classic haystacks of uh, organisms within the enterocyte cytoplasm. And finally, one more rabbit disease. Um, this is a disease that's often associated with colonic dis or cecal dysbiosis or, or a lack of roughage in the diet. It's been reproduced by ligation of the cecum. So the cecum is extremely important. But this is a disease known as mucoid enteropathy, one that we've known about for 50 years. Um, commonly uh, affects weanling rabbits between 7 to 14 weeks of age. And their, their usual appearance is sort of a crouch stance, um, a very thin conformation, bruxism, and then when they pass stools, it's usually diarrhea with a high content of, of mucus in them. The disease name is mucoid enteritis or mucoid enteropathy. And the causative agent has not really been identified. It's thought to be a gram-negative agent of some kind, which in combination with cecal stasis, impaction, or a lack of fiber in the diet will release a substance causing a transformation of all of the cells lining the large intestine into mucus producing cells and so the, there's tremendous amount of mucus produced the animal eventually uh, dies of mucoid enteropathy so some questions left about that particular agent okay well it's been well over half an hour on this one these are some certainly not all the bacterial diseases of the large intestine. I hope I touched on a lot of them. I hope that you got something out of this lecture. And we will finish diseases of the large intestine with the Helminth diseases and some spontaneous unclassified diseases um, and a few tumors in our next lecture. I hope you'll come back for that.